Oh, great. Thank you. Thanks, Alana. <laughs> um, the Zoom call is going to be recorded um, and we'll post it uh, on YouTube after with the link. Great. Um, we also would like to thank our sponsors, uh, Wildlife Habitat Canada. Uh, we're really grateful for our sponsors because uh, with their support, we're able to make webinars like this free uh, and open to the public. Uh, so as I mentioned, my name's Emma. I'm a field technician uh, with the Wetland Workforce and the Conservation Stewardship Team with the BC Wildlife Federation. Uh, I just wanted to give a quick overview of the BC Wildlife Federation in case you are not familiar with all of our programs. Uh, so the Wetland Education Program uh, runs numerous different uh, in-person and virtual educational workshops uh, all over the province of BC. These include the Wetlands Institute, Map Our Marshes, and Wetland Keepers. Um, and the Wetlands Workforce has work pods which operate uh, throughout the province and do wetland uh, monitoring and maintenance and assessment work at our restoration sites. Uh, we also have our youth department, which does summer camps, as well as uh, school programming and different education events for youth. We have our fish habitat restoration and education program, which does uh, a lot of riparian restoration work, planting workshops, um, and educational workshops. And then we have our lovely in-office staff that uh, work on organizing our membership as well as processing core certificates, uh, which are needed if you want to become a hunter in British Columbia. Uh, so yeah, we run uh, numerous projects all over the province. And if you'd like more information, you can go to our website. It's bcwf.bc.ca. Uh, so, for this webinar, we would love if everybody could stick to please using the chat. Uh, if you have any questions at all that come up throughout the webinar, uh, you're more than welcome to stick them in the chat. And we're going to have about 10 minutes at the end for discussion and questions. Um, and please keep yourself muted to avoid uh, any background noise. Um, and we are recording uh, this webinar and we'll be posting it on YouTube later. Uh, great. So the topic today is the fungi of wetlands. Uh, presented by Todd. Todd is a grant writer and coordinator with the BC Wildlife Federation. So we're really grateful to have him on our grant writing team uh, because thanks to him and the team, we're able to operate so many programs that we do. Uh, so I will pass it off to Todd. Right. Just share my screen. Can we see this? Yeah, great. Cool. All right, hi everyone. My name is Todd. Um, as Emma said, I am the grant writer and coordinator for the BC Wildlife Federation. Um, I'm also an amateur mycologist. Um, and I'm interested in all aspects of fungi, including ecology, identification, taxonomy, and foraging. Uh, my current research interests are in Australian taxonomy and genus Cordonarius in particular. And I'm working to hopefully describe some new species in the next few years. Um, so today we're going to talk about fungi and wetlands. Uh, fungi are these kind of weird, overlooked organisms that are actually very vital to wetland ecosystems. Um, they're overlooked partly because they're ephemeral beings um, and they're hard to find. Um, and mycology as a field is quite underfunded, even more so than the other natural sciences. Um, so today I'll go through the roles fungi have in wetlands and what kind of ecological relationships they have with plants. And I'll introduce like 15 rare fungi to look for when you're in a wetland. Um, this is gonna be a non-exhaustive list and you'll likely find a lot more species, including many undescribed species in wetlands but I'm just trying to showcase some that have some like high value for documentation on iNaturalist in particular. 
um, just to better understand their range. Um, it's hard to understand the conservation status of fungi if we don't even know where they exist or not. Um, and then one last note, I will be using scientific names because these fungi are too rare to have common names. Okay, great. Um, let's start off with some basics. Uh, what kind of functions do wet, or fungi have in wetlands, both positive and negative? Uh, perhaps their most well-known function is the kind of decomposition of organic matter to return nutrients back into the soil. Um, so this would allow uh, new plants to take up the nutrients, and this is an integral part of the carbon cycle. Uh, fungi will also help break down harmful chemicals to prevent damage to plants. And mycorrhizal fungi in particular, which we'll get into in a sec, um, will facilitate nutrient exchange with plants via symbiosis, um, wherein the fungi will help give plants nitrogen and phosphorus, and plants will in turn return carbon back to the fungus. And finally, uh, fungi are also well-known plant pathogens. Um, and we'll talk about one today, um, but there are so many others, including a lot of rusts. Um, like if you see a plant leaf that's become orange, that's often because of a rust fungus. Um, and I'll just cover some basic terms I'll be using today. Um, so a fungus is an organism that encompasses um, the mycelium, and often a fruiting body, which is also known as a mushroom in colloquial terms. Um, so when you see a mushroom, you're only seeing one part of it. Most of the organism is underground in these string-like structures called mycelium. And mycelium is in turn made up of these microscopic filaments called hyphae. And these hyphae are what interact with uh, plants. Uh, fungi are traditionally separated into three types of ecologies. Uh, the first one is called mycorrhizal. This comes from, from the Greek words uh, mycus and rhiza. Mycus means fungus and rhiza means root. And this word refers to the relationship where um, the fungal mycelium will link up to a plant root. And in that exchange is where the nutrients get exchanged um, and this is illustrated in this image. Um, pictorially, you can kind of see how the fungal mycelium is attaching to the plant root. Uh, the second type of ecology is called saprobic or saprophytic. Uh, so this refers to the decomposing fungi. So as we see in the top image, we see oyster mushrooms um, that are decomposing the log that it's growing on. Um, and we also see in the bottom image, Asterophora species um, decomposing a dead mushroom, in this case, a Russula species. And the last ecology is called parasitic. So this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, in this example, um, our malaria species, also known as honey mushrooms, are parasitizing their host tree and it will eventually kill the tree, perhaps not now, but in many, many years. And then mycorrhizal fungi are further divided into four traditional categories, although this number is kind of debated in the literature. Um, but for now, we're just going to focus on the first two, ectomycorrhizal and arbusculomycorrhizal, um, which is a form of an endomycorrhizal relationship. And I'm going to go through all of these terms now because these are a lot of big words. All right, so part one, we're going to discuss some mycorrhizal wetland fungi. Um, and I'll provide a few um, examples to look for when you're in a wetland. And first, we're going to talk about arbuscular mycorrhizae. Um, this is probably the most important type of mycorrhiza um, because it is so prominent in the plant world. Um, this refers to a type of mycorrhizal relationship where the fungus will penetrate the plant root to form arbuscules. And I'm going to show a picture in a few slides to make that more concrete. Um, these are the oldest lineage of mycorrhizae. These appeared somewhere around 460 million years ago. 
And so what that means is fungi and plants likely co-evolve together to the point that now more than 80% of plants um, form our vescular mycorrhizae. Um, our vescular mycorrhizae provide all sorts of benefits, um, including resistance to pathogens and other types of immunity, um, drought tolerance, salt tolerance, heavy metal tolerance, and of course, nutrient exchange, as we, we've talked about already. Uh, it, interestingly, we used to think that wetlands didn't have much arbuscular mycorrhizae uh, because we thought wetlands had too low of an oxygen content to facilitate the growth of fungi. Uh, but recent research has shown that they actually are present and they are very important to the ecosystem, uh, but they're actually less common um, than drier terrain because of this low oxygen. Uh, the fungi that produce arbuscular mycorrhizae with plants are called glomeromycetes. And these are found in a different phylum than your traditional mushrooms, which are usually basidiomycota or ascomycota. Um, glomeromycetes are um, what we call obligate symbionts. Uh, so what that means is they require a host plant in order to complete their life cycle and propagate. Um, but before they even attach to a plant, they have to germinate in the soil first. And so they actually go hostless for the first couple of weeks before they actually link up with the plant. Um, glomeromycetes are mostly microscopic, so usually you won't see them in the wild. They might be slightly microscopic, so you might be able to see them with an, your, your naked eye. Um, but otherwise, these are very uncommon to find just on a regular walk. Uh, right now, we have about 300 described species, which is actually a very small number. Um, and that might be because we haven't found all of them, and there's probably a lot of undescribed species. Um, or perhaps it's because they readily form mycorrhizae with a large variety of plants, um, so they don't end up speciating as much as ectomycorrhizal fungi, which I'll get into in a sec. Um, so yeah, ectomycorrhizae, on the other hand, are a type of mycorrhiza where the mycelium remains outside of the plant cells, which is why it's called ecto. And again, I'll show a diagram in a second, just to make that more clear. Um, ectomycorrhizal fungi belong in the phyla Basidiomycota and Ascomycota. And this time, they're way more described species. Um, estimates around more than 7,000 and probably thousands more undescribed ones. A lot of them are macrofungi. Um, so you'll be able to collect them, see them regularly on a walk. Um, but there are also a lot of micro um, ectomycorrhizal fungi. Uh, so these include your typical mushrooms and common edible mushrooms like your chanarelles, your matsutake, your porcini. Um, ectomycorrhizal fungi are not as promiscuous as their arbuscular counterparts. They're a lot more picky about what kind of plant they'll associate with. Uh, right now, we know about 2% of plant species form ectomycorrhizae. And this is usually only um, woody plants or trees. Um, these are also a newer lineage. They appeared about 100 to 200 million years ago versus the arbuscular ones that appeared more than 400 million years ago. And most trees in BC will form ectomycorrhizae with the exception of cedars and maples. And so if you're a mushroom hunter, you often don't like to be in cedar or maple dominant forests because of that reason. And so then here is the diagram um, of the different mycorrhizae, just comparing them. Um, so on the left, we have the ectomycorrhizae so as you can see, the mycelium is just surrounding the plant cell to form what's called a hartig net. It's not actually penetrating the cell, but in the arbuscular mycorrhiza, the mycelium is penetrating the cell to form these arbuscules. And this is just um, a microscopic image of what an arbuscular mycorrhiza looks like. As you can see on the right, it forms this kind of root tree-like structure in the plant cell.
All right, so now I'm just going to get into the actual mushrooms you might see. So again, if you see these, it's important to document them on iNaturalist. Um, make sure to take good quality photos from all angles. Um, and feel free to tag me in your observation if you need an identification, and I'll provide my contact info at the end. Um, so the first one uh, we have is Lacaria pumila. Um, it's mycorrhizal with birch or with willow, alder, birch, and conifers. Um, they're this kind of small pink orange mushroom with pink gills. Um, so they're kind of distinctive looking like that, but they are similar to other Lacaria species. Um, so if you're identifying it on iNaturalists, um, it's often better to just leave it at Lacaria at the genus level. Uh, next we have Cordonarius chrysolidus. Um, this is mycorrhizal with spruce or alder maybe, um, and it's found fruiting in sphagnum. So you need the tree nearby, but the actual mushroom will fruit in sphagnum moss. Um, I would say this is harder to identify. It has like this yellow olivaceous tone everywhere, um, but it's otherwise it's kind of drab looking mushroom. Um, it's genetically related to dermosity mushrooms. And if you're familiar with mushroom dyeing, you've probably heard of dermosity because they're highly sought out dye mushrooms. So this might be a potential species that could be used for dyeing. Um, but I don't think anyone has used it to my knowledge. Um, another related one is called Cordonarius sphagnophilus. Um, this one is mycorrhizal with conifers, and it is also found fruiting in sphagnum. Um, this one's even harder to identify, I would say, because there's nothing really unique about it. Um, you could potentially identify it by the color or the cap texture, as well as this bulbous base. But there are hundreds of quaternary species that look exactly like this, which makes it hard to identify. But it's cool if you do find it. And the last mycorrhizal one I have is called Lexanum polypus. Uh, so this is mycorrhizal with birch. And again, it is often fruiting in sphagnum moss. Um, I would say this is pretty easy to identify. Um, this is a distinctive looking white-ish bolete. Um, and a bolete is a mushroom that has pores beneath the cap rather than gills. Um, this species also has black scabers or dots on the stipe. Um, and as you can see in the image, the base will also stain blue. So this is quite a distinctive looking mushroom. And this is the only edible species that I'm sharing today. All right, so that was it for the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, so now I'm gonna move on to the non-mycorrhizal fungi. And this includes your saprobic and your parasitic mushrooms. Um, before I go further, I'm gonna talk a bit about sphagnum. So if you noticed already, um, the mushrooms I'm showing have this unique relationship to sphagnum. Um, and just as a reminder, sphagnum is this special type of moss that's often found in bogs. Um, they will form peat, which is this kind of accumulation of decaying organic matter. And this will lead to the acidification of the soil and low oxygen as well. And so we find that there's a very unique fungi that exists with sphagnum, which is really interesting because we don't really know why. Um, you could potentially hypothesize because it's um, of the low pH or the low oxygen level or perhaps a different mineral composition. Um, I think this would be a very interesting PhD project or research project if anyone here is interested in pursuing that further. Um, and just another anatomical diagram of what a parasitic fungus might look like. Um, as we can see, the fungal mycelium is penetrating the plant cell uh, to form these structures called haustoria. And these look very similar to arbuscules. Um, but they are different in that instead of nutrient exchange, um, the fungus is just taking nutrients away. 
And there are also a wide variety of other linkages that include structures besides Haustoria, but that's beyond the talk for now. All right, so now I'm just gonna get into the rest of the fungi. Um, a lot of these are unfortunately very drab looking, very boring to look at, but they are interesting because they're rare and they should be documented. Um, and the first one we have is Cufophilus cinerellus. Uh, this mushroom is biotrophic with sphagnum. Biotrophic is a type of parasitic relationship where the fungus is taking nutrients away from the host plant, but doesn't kill the host plant. And right now, the relationship is still unclear with this species, um, but this is what we think for now. I said this was easy to identify because it does have a more distinctive look. It definitely has this kind of waxy appearance. Um, it has these well-spaced, thick white gills with a dark cast, and they do have a dark cap. Um, and they they belong to a family of mushrooms called the waxy caps. The next one we have is Arenia philonotis. This is a parasitic mushroom on moss, and it is a facultative sphagnophile, um, which means that it grows in sphagnum and it likes sphagnum, but it can grow in other mosses as well. Um, these are on phalanoid mushrooms, and what that means is they're small and they're funnel shaped. Um, they're unfortunately also brown and very easy to look past. Um, but they are interesting once you do find them. Uh, they can be confused with other Arrhenia species, which also grow with moss. Um, so oftentimes we'll need microscopy or DNA analysis to get the species. Uh, the next one we have is Mycena megaspora. Again, a very drab looking mushroom, but the thing that makes this one interesting is that when you pull it out, you'll have this long rooting stipe, which is quite unusual. And that's the key characteristic to get you to identify this species. Um, and it is saprobic in sphagnum moss. Okay, the next two are just like so boring, I can't even like redeem them. They're just brown mushrooms. Gallerina paludosa is parasitic on sphagnum. You might be able to distinguish them because they have these white veil speckles on them. Um, but they look very similar to the next one, Gallerina tibiae cystis. Again, parasitic on sphagnum. The only way to really distinguish these is via microscopy or DNA analysis. And you also have a host of other Gallerina species that look very similar. Um, so when you are posting these on iNaturalist, it is better to just leave it at genus level and call them Gallerina species. Okay, this one is actually interesting. Stagnarus palister um, has a very interesting ecology. It is necrotrophic on sphagnum, and it is a plant pathogen. It will infect sphagnum and start digesting it from the inside, and then it eventually kills it and lives off the dead tissues. It is still harder to identify because it's not very interesting to look at. Um, it has like a darker cap and a darker stipe, and it has white gills. Um, and you'll often find it with uh, dying sphagnum around that's becoming yellow. Um, and if you're familiar with growing sphagnum yourself, you've probably heard of this species as well. Trichoglossum species is a type of earth tongue, uh, which is a very descriptive name for this. Um, they are saprobic and sphagnum. It seems to be an undescribed species or potentially a species complex. Um, and because of the distinctive shape, they are quite easy to identify. Um, they are very similar to geoglossum species, which is another type of earth tongue, but these can be distinguished by using a hand lens. Um, if you look at a trichoglossum, you will see tiny hairs. But if you look at a geoglossum, you will see a completely smooth surface. All right, okay, back to the drab looking ones, Hyphaloma helengatum. This one is saprobic in moss, including sphagnum. 
Um, the only thing that really distinguishes this is that the spore print is this kind of purple brown color versus the other ones, which were more brown or more white. Um, unfortunately, this one is also very similar to other hypoloma species, some of which are undescribed. Um, so if you are posting this to iNaturalist, it might be safer to just leave it at genus as well. All right, we're getting to the end. Um, this one, Mythicomyces cornaipes, it is saprobic in wet forested area. So we're moving away from the sphagnum now. Um, they are again, a very drab brown mushroom, but they do have a brighter cap and they have a two-toned stipe, which is an important characteristic. So it's lighter near the top and darker near the base. And they have a light brown spore print with a purple tint, which is important because Stagnicola perplexa looks exactly the same. And it has a spore print that is brown without a purple tint. And this species is also found in wet areas, bogs and temporary pools, and it is saprobic as well. All right, and the last one we have is Candeliomyces typhi. Um, this one is really interesting ecologically because it's saprobic on dead typha and carrick species, so cattails and sedges. Although they're, again, a very drab brown mushroom, I would say they're easier to identify because of its unusual habitat. Um, if so, next time you're in like a cattail or sedge area, look near the waterline and see if you can spot these mushrooms growing because there are very few mushrooms that will actually grow on dead cattails and sedges. And they have been confirmed to be seen in the Slocan Valley, if you happen to be around there. Um, so that was the last mushroom I had. And that concludes the presentation. Um, I have my contact information at the bottom um, if you need to get your mushroom identified or if you want to tag me on iNaturalist. Um, but otherwise, I will open it up to questions. I have a question. Did you take all those photos, Todd? No, no, no. These are not all mine. <laughs> um, a lot of these were taken from iNaturalist observations. Um, a lot of them are from Oregon. Most of them actually don't have observations in BC, which is why I'm really emphasizing that we need to document these, because I'm pretty confident that they'll appear here as well. Uh, we just need people out there looking for um, the mushrooms. So in the way that they displayed the mushrooms, is that how you recommend to take photos for IDing purposes? Like one is like still in the ground, the other one's pulled out and like you see the gills? Yes, this is the best type of photo to take. Because um, most importantly, you need a picture of the underside. Um, so the gills or the pores specifically, because that will help distinguish you or distinguish the really boring mushrooms from each other. Cool, thanks. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, what are the conservation implications? Um, are these mushrooms in endangered habitats? I think the question about conservation can't even be had yet. <laughs> like when you're thinking about plants and animals, we know the plants and animals that are out there. Like we can give names to them. In mycology, we can't even say what's out there yet because there's so many undescribed species and no one has really, or like us governments have not, you know, promised funding to help document them or research them. So for now, the pressing issue is just to actually find them and just get a name to them. We don't, we don't even know if they're common or not or if they're even threatened, if they change, because we just have no data on them. 
Um, are they in endangered habitats? I guess you could say wetlands in general are endangered. <laughs> um, they've been, you know, systemically like eradicated with human development. Um, so yes, it is very important to document it because of that. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, we have another one saying, uh, are there any micro courses or further webinars that you know of that you would recommend for someone to learn more? Um, that's a hard question. I think you can try joining your local mycological society. Um, they often have presentations from guest speakers and experts in the field. Um, I mean, part of the issue, again, is that there are so few experts because of the lack of funding. Um, so it's often like amateurs like myself who end up kind of doing like our self-research or just kind of delving into something um, because it's so such an unprofessionalized field. Um, but yeah, mycological societies for sure. I can't really think of what other resources are out there, unfortunately. Yeah, no, that's great. That makes sense. Um, we have lots of great discussion in the chat. Thanks, everybody. Um, are there specific fruiting seasons for wetland fungi? Yes, so the majority of fungi will grow in autumn. Um, so somewhere between September and November. Um, some mushrooms will also fruit in the spring or really year round if the conditions are right. Uh, like for example, um, Candelillomyces typhi was found once in May. Um, but in general, you should be looking in autumn. Thanks, good to know. Um, okay, we have another question. Could you speak more broadly about the role of wetland fungi in nutrient cycling and carbon sequestration? Yeah, yeah. Um, like it's very much like, you know, a dead tree falls and you need to get the nutrients in the trees back into the soil so that the new trees can take up those nutrients. And so wetland fungi, particularly the saprobic ones, um, will start digesting, you know, wood or other organic matter. Um, and they'll cause different types of rots. Uh, for example, there's like white rot or there's brown rot. And it refers to the specific um, chemical that they're breaking down in the wood. Um, I guess broadly, this is important because if there were no fungi, you know, like the wood would just sit there, you know, like forever. <laughs> yeah. Nice, great, thanks, that makes sense. I really like these next two questions. Um, are there any conversations amongst mycologists about the introduction of non-native fungi via the horticulture industry? Mm, okay, yeah, that's definitely beyond my knowledge. Um, <laughs> I know there have been some concerns about um, golden oyster mushrooms escaping into the wild. And we've seen that in Eastern North America. And what basically happened was someone or some people wanted to grow their own golden oysters at home for their like own purposes. And somehow the spores escaped into the wild and they started um, growing like all over Eastern and North America. I think there's been like one sighting in Washington. And so there's some concerns that that fungus is displacing native fungi. Um, in terms of horticulture, I can't say much. I don't know much. Um, but again, I think this gets down to we don't even know enough to say whether something is, you know, endangered or being threatened because of non-native fungi, because um, there's just so little data. Yeah, 
Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. I think someone else had sent um, a species that's introduced as well here. Um, great. Um, we have another question. Are there any specific fungi species you'd recommend prescribing for wetland restoration, or is it better that they naturally establish? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question because this has been a new topic, particularly in agriculture. Um, and they've tried to do research around whether it's beneficial to introduce um, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi into agriculture or restoration sites just to help the plants um, grow. And so in theory, they should grow better because these fungi are facilitating um, like nutrient exchange so that plants grow quicker. Um, but one, there's not enough research. <laughs> and two, they found some um, research where the fungi don't end up doing anything. And so I think this question doesn't have an answer yet. Um, but I do know some gardeners might even introduce arbuscular fungi, whether it works is probably an unanswered question. Thanks. Yeah, interesting topic. I was wondering the same thing. That's good to know. Um, what are some of your favorite uh, ID field guides, especially for Eastern BC? Yeah, so the, I would say the gold standard book right now is Mushrooms of BC um, by, I believe it's Adam, Adam McKinnon. And I forgot the second author. Um, but yeah, that is the golden standard for now. It was published three years ago now. Um, but it is still incomprehensive, again, just because we don't know everything. Um, there's a database online that is incredibly comprehensive, and it's updated live with new genetic analysis. Um, and it's called... Um, all right, I've got the name. Um, I can post the website in... Actually, give me a second here. Yeah, no, that's great. I'm just going to post the website link just so people can favorite it. Give me a second. All right, got it. Okay. Um, so this is this website is ran by Danny, Danny Miller, the one I just posted in the chat. Um, Danny Miller is based in Seattle, and he has this really comprehensive key that everyone in the Pacific Northwest uses. Um, and I would say this is actually the gold standard online um, because it is updated live. Um, all that the rain promises and more is also commonly recommended, but it's actually not the best one for us because the author is based in California. So a lot of the fungi in that book don't appear here. And that book is really old. I think it's from the 80s and it hasn't been updated since then. So some of the information, or at least the taxonomy is outdated, but it is a very fun book. I recommend it just because every mushroom person has it, um, but functionally it's not the most useful one. Thanks. Oh, actually, one more comment. Um, fungi have a much broader range than plants. So you'll often find the same fungi in Eastern BC as Western BC, which is not always the case for plants. But um, fungal regions are a lot larger. So Pacific Northwest is generally what we call one fungal region. Thanks. I didn't know that. Um, oh, and then Emily had 
a follow-up question. Is the same process applicable to sphagnum in wetlands where woody debris is limited? I think that was relating to the uh, nutrient cycling question. Yeah, I guess in that case, I wouldn't know enough to answer this thoroughly, um, but there might be some articles out there. But yeah, unfortunately, I don't have an answer. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and then we have one more question. Have you seen the documentary Fantastic Fungi? And if so, what did you think of the claims it makes? I have, I have seen it. <laughs> yeah, um, I honestly can't remember much. <laughs> So if you have an example of the claims, um, that would be useful to jog my memory. Great. Thanks, lots of positive feedback in the chat. Thanks everybody, it's great. Okay, so Lorna says that mushrooms are key to human brain evolution. Yeah, that's definitely a more unsubstantiated claim and probably hard to prove. Um, I think it's an interesting claim and maybe helps us think about like potentially how psilocybin helps or potentially influences brain chemistry. Um, for now, I would call it, yeah, an unsubstantiated claim. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Todd. Thanks for answering all those questions. That's really great. Um, yeah, well, actually, I'm going to comment on Becky's comment as well. So she said, Amanita phylloides was introduced here on European hornbeam species. Yeah, so if um, people aren't familiar, Amanita phylloides is also known as the death cap. And you'll often find them in urban settings under imported European trees. Um, Currently, they are mostly limited to the European trees. Uh, they have been found to jump to native Gary oak trees on the island. Um, in California, they're actually quite invasive because they California has a lot more oak trees down there. But for now in BC, it's still quite limited to urban areas. Nice. All right. Well, thank you so much. This was great. Um, yeah. Thank you for coming out and for the positive feedback. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Todd, for presenting. This is great. Yeah. Thanks, um, everyone. Um, and again, yeah. Other... Go ahead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. Yeah, we have other webinars coming up in the series, so check those out. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.